Chapter 6, Big Steps Ahead To the extent we thought about it, and we seldom did, we used to think aging would be a very, very complicated thing to change, if we could change it at all. For most of human history, of course, we simply saw aging as the coming of the seasons. Indeed, the shift from spring to summer to fall to winter was a common ana- analogy we used to describe the movement from childhood to young adult to middle age to our golden years. More recently, we figured that aging was inexorable but we might be able to deal with some of the diseases that made it a less appealing process. Later still, we figured that we might be able to attack each of the hallmarks and perhaps we could treat a few of the symptoms at a time. Even then, it seemed as though it would be a huge endeavor. But here's the thing. It's really not. Once you recognize that there are universal regulators of aging in everything from yeast to roundworms to mice to humans, and once you understand that those regulators can be changed with a molecule such as NMN, or a few hours of vigorous exercise, or a few less meals, and once you realize that it's all just one disease, it all becomes clear. Aging is going to be remarkably easy to tackle, easier than cancer. I know how that sounds. It sounds crazy. But so did the idea of microorganisms before an amateur scientist named Anthony von Leeuwenhoek first described the world of small little animals he saw on his homemade microscope in 1671. For hundreds of years to come, doctors rebelled against the idea that they needed to wash their hands before surgery. Now, infections, one of the chief reasons patients used to die after surgery, have become the very thing hospital personnel are most fastidiously attentive to preventing in the operating room. Just by washing up after or before surgery, we have profoundly improved the rates at which patients survive. Once we understood what the problem was, it was an easy problem to solve. For goodness sake, we solved it with soap. The The idea of vaccines would have also sounded crazy to most people before the English physician Edward Jenner successfully used fluid he had gathered from cowpox blister to inoculate an 80-year-old boy named James Phillips in what would today be an egregiously unethical experiment, but at the time sparked a new era of immunological medicine. Indeed, the idea of giving a patient a little bit of a disease in order to prevent a lot of disease would have been seen as insane, even potentially homicidal to many people until Jenner did it in 1796. We now know that vaccines are the single most effective medical intervention in human history in terms of saving and extending lifespans. So... Again, once you understood the, what the problem was, it was an easy one to solve. The success of STACs and AMPK activators and mTOR inhibitors are a tremendously powerful indicator that we are working in an area of biology that is upstream of every major aging-related disease. The fact that these molecules have been shown to extend the lifespan in virtually every organism they've been tested on is further evidence that we are engaging in an ancient and powerful program to prolong life. 
but there is another pharmaceutical target that could increase our longevity just a bit downstream from the processes we believe longevity molecules are impacting but still upstream of a lot of symptoms of aging you might recall that one of the key hallmarks of aging is accumulation of senescent cells these cells have uh, permanently ceased reproduction young human cells taken out of the body and grown in a petri dish divide about 40 to 60 times until their telomeres become critically short a point discovered by anatomist Leonard Hayflick that we now call the Hayflick limit although the enzyme known as telomerase extend telomeres the discovery which afforded Elizabeth Blackburn Carol Grider and Jack shows that a Nobel prize in 2009 is switched off to protect us from cancer except in stem cells in 1997 It was a remarkable finding that if you put telomeres into cultured skin cells, they don't even senescence. Why short telomeres cause senescence has been mostly worked out. A very short telomeres will lose its histone packaging. And like a shoelace that's lost an agelet, um, the DNA at the end of the chromosome becomes exposed. the cell detects the dna end and thinks it's a dna break it goes to work to try to repair the dna and sometimes fusing two ends of different chromosomes together which leads to hypogenome instability as chromosomes are shredded during cell division and fused again over and over potentially becoming a cancer the other safer solution to a short telomere is to shut down the cell This happens, I believe, by permanently engaging the survival circuit. The exposed terminal area is seen as a DNA break, causes epigenetic factors such as sirtuins to leave their posts permanently in an attempt to repair the damage. But there's no other DNA end to ligate it to. This shuts the cell replication down, similar to the way that broken DNA in old yeast distract sirtu from the mating genes and shuts down fertility triggering of the dna damage response and major alterations to the epigenome are well known to occur in human senescent cells and when we introduce epigenetic noise into the ice cells they go on to senescence earlier than untreated cells So maybe this idea has merit. I suspect that senescence in nerve and muscle cells which don't divide much or at all is the result of epigenetic noise that causes cells to lose their identity and shut down. The one's beneficial response which evolved to help cells survive DNA damage has a dark side. The permanently panicked cell sends out signals to surrounding cells causing them to panic too. Senescent cells are often referred to as zombie cells because even though they should be dead they refuse to die. In the petri dish and in frozen thinly sliced tissue sections we can stain zombie cells blue because they make a rare enzyme called beta galactosidase. And when we do that, they light up clearly. The older the cells, the more blue we see. For example, a sample of white fat looks white when we are in our 20s, pale blue in middle age and dark world blue in blue age, um, in old age. And that's scary because when we have lots of these senescent cells in our bodies, it's a clear sign that aging is getting a strong grip on us. A small number of senescent cells can cause widespread havoc. Even though they stop dividing, they can 
continue to release tiny proteins called cytokines that cause inflammation and attract immune cells called macrophages that then attack the tissue. Being chronically inflamed is unhealthy, just like someone with multiple sclerosis. Inflammatory bowel disease or prosiasis. These um, diseases are associated with excess, excess cytokine proteins. Inflammation is also a driving force in heart disease, diabetes, proteins, and dementia. It's so central to the development of age-related diseases that scientists often refer to the process as inflammation. And cytokines don't just cause inflammation, they cause other cells to become zombies, like a biological apocalypse. When this happens, they can even stimulate surrounding cells to become a tumor and spread. We already know that destroying senescent cells in mice can give them substantially healthier and significantly longer lives. It keeps their kidneys functioning better for longer. It makes their hearts more resist resistant to stress. And their lifespans are, as a result, 20 to 30% longer. Although, according to uh, research led by Mayo Clinic molecular biologist Darren Baker and Jan Van Dursen, In animal models of disease, killing of senescent cells makes fibrotic lungs more pliable, slows down the progression of glaucoma and osteoarthritis, and reduces the size of all sorts of tumors. Understanding why senescence evolved is not an academic exercise. It could help us design better ways to prevent or kill senescent cells. Cellular senescence is a consequence of our inherited primordial survival circuits, which evolved to stop cell division and reproduction when DNA breaks were detected. Just as in old yeast cells, if DNA breaks happen too frequently or when they overwhelm the circuit, human cells will stop dividing, then sit there in a panic trying to repair the damage, messing up the epigenome and secreting cytokines. This is the final state of cellular aging, and it's not pretty. If zombie cells are so bad for our health, why doesn't our body just kill them off? Why are senescent cells allowed to cause trouble for decades? Back in the 1950s, the evolutionary biologist George Williams was already on the case. His work, built on by Judith Kempisi from the Buck Institute of Research on Aging in California proposes that we evolve senescence as a rather clever trick to prevent cancer when we are in our 30s and 40s. Senescent cells, after all, don't divide, which means that cells with mutations are unable to spread and form tumors. But if senescence evolved to prevent cancer, why would it eventually promote cancer in adjacent tissue, not to mention a host of other aging-related symptoms. This is where antagonistic pleiotrophy comes into play. The idea that a survival mechanism that is good for us when we are young is kept through evolution because this far outweighs any problems it might cause when we get older. Yes, natural Selection is callous, but it works. Consider the 15 million year hominids, the, the great apes in the vast majority of our family's evolutionary journey. The forces of predation, starvation, disease, maternal mortality, infection, catastrophic weather events, the intraspecies of violence meant that very few individuals saw more than a decade or two of life. Even in the relatively recent era of homogeneous, what we now think of as middle age, 
um, is an exceptionally new phenomenon. Life expectancy of 50 and beyond was simply not a reality for most of our evolutionary history. Therefore, it didn't matter if a mechanism for slowing the spread of cancer would eventually cause more cancer and other diseases because it generally worked as long as it allowed people to breed and rear some children. The saber-toothed tigers took things from there. <laughs> These days, of course, pe- very few people have to worry about being picked off by hungry predators. Hunger and malnutrition are still too far common, but abject starvation is increasingly rare. We're getting better and better at staving off childhood diseases and have eliminated some of them entirely. Childbirth is an increasingly safe affair, although that too is something that can be vastly improved upon, especially in the developing world. Modern sanitation has resulted in tremendous improvements in the rates at which we die of infectious diseases. Modern technology is helping to warn us of impending catastrophes such as hurricanes, and volcanic eruptions and although the the world often seems to be a vicious and violent place the worldwide homicide rate and the numbers of wars globally have been falling for decades so we live longer and evolution hasn't had a chance to catch up we are played by senescent cells which might as well be radioactive waste If you put a tiny dab of these cells under a young mouse's skin, it won't be long before the inflammation spreads and the entire mouse is filled with zombie cells that cause premature signs of aging. A class of pharmaceuticals called Senolytics may be the zombie killers we need to fight the battle against aging on this front. These small molecule drugs are designed to specifically kill senescent cells by inducing the death program that should have happened in the first place. That's what the Mayo Clinic's James Kirkland has done. He needed a quick course of two senolytic molecules, quercetin, which is found in capers, kale, and red onions, and a drug called tesatinibib, which is a standard chemotherapy treatment for leukemia to eliminate the senescent cells in lab mice and extend their lifespan by 36%. The implication of this work cannot be overstated. If senolytics work, you could take a course of medicine for a week, be, be rejuvenated, and come back 10 years later for another course. Meanwhile, the same med- medicines could be injected into an osteoarthritic joint or with an eye going blind or inhaled into the lungs made fibrotic and inflexible by chemotherapy to give them an age reversal boost too. Rapamycin, the Easter Island longevity molecule, is what's known as semosinomorphic molecule in that it doesn't kill senescent cells but does prevent them from releasing inflammatory molecules which may be almost as good. The first human trials of senolytics were started in 2018 to treat osteoarthritis and glaucoma. Conditions in which senescent cells can accumulate, it'll be a few more years before we know enough about the effects and safety of these drugs to provide them to everyone, but if they work, the potential is vast. But there's another option, just a bit further upstream, that could be even better. The Hitchhiker's Guide The selfish genes we discussed earlier called Line 1, retrotranspoons and their fossil remnants make up about half of the human genome, which is often referred to as the junk DNA. It's a lot of genetic baggage and they're sneaky buggers. In young cells, these ancient mobile DNA elements known as retrotransposons are prevented by chromatin from jumping out of the gem- genome, then breaking the DNA to reinsert, the, reinsert themselves elsewhere. We and others have shown that line 1 genes are bundled up and rendered silent by sirtuins. 
But as mice age and possibly as we do as well, the surgeons become scattered all over the genome, having been recruited away to repair DNA breaks elsewhere, and many of them never find their way home. Their loss is exacerbated by a drop in NAD levels, the same thing we first saw in old yeast. Without surgeons to spool the chromatin and silence the transpone DNA, cells start to transcribe these endogenous viruses. This is bad, and it only gets worse. Over time, as mice age, the once silent line one prisoners are torn into RNA and the RNA is torn into DNA, which is reinserted into the genome at a different place. Besides creating genome instability and epigenomic noise that causes inflammation, Line 1 DNA leaks from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where it's recognized as a foreign invader. In response, the cells release more immunostimulatory cytokines um, that cause inflammation throughout the body. New work by John Sadevi at Brown University and Vera Gorbonova from the University of Rochester raises the possibility that one of the main reasons SRTT6 mutant mice age so rapidly is that they is that these retroviral hellhounds have no leash causing numerous DNA breaks and the epigenome um, is caused to degrade rapidly instead of slowly. Convincing evidence has come to from experiments showing antiretrovirals, the same kinds used to fight HIV, extend the lifespan of SRT6 mutant mice about twofold. It may turn out that NAD levels decline with age, so twins are rendered un- unable to silence retrotransform DNA. Perhaps one day, safe antiretroviral drugs or NAD boosters will be used to keep these jumping genes silent. We would not have stopped aging completely at its source, but we would be fighting the battle before total anarchy ensues and the genie that is aging becomes even harder to put back into a bottle. Vax into the future. In 2018, scientists at Stanford University reported that they had developed an inoculation that significantly lowered the rates at which mice suffered from breast, lung, and skin cancer. By injecting mice with stem cells inactivated by radiation and later adding a booster shot like those human use for tetanus, hepatitis B, and whooping cough, the stem cells prime the immune system to attack cancer cells that normally would be invisible to the immune system. Other Immuno-oncological approaches are making even greater strides. Therapies such as PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, which expose cancer cells so that they can be killed, and chimeric antigen receptors, therapies which modify the patient's own immune T cells, can re-inject them to go kill cancer cells, are saving people's lives who just a few years before have been told to go home and make funeral arrangements. Now, some of these patients are being given a new lease on life. If we can use the immune system to kill cancer cells, it stands to reason that we can do just that for senescent cells too. Um, and some scientists are on the case. Judith Campisi from the Buck Institute for Research on Aging and Manuel Serrano from Barcelona University believe that senescent cells, like cancer cells, remain invisible to the immune system by waving little protein signs that say, no zombie cells here. If Campisi and Serrano are right, we should be able to take away those signs and give the immune system permission to go kill senescent cells. Perhaps a few decades from now, a typical vaccine schedule that currently protects babies against polio, measles, mumps, and rubella might also include a shot to prevent senescence when they reach middle age. When people first hear that it may be possible to vaccinate against aging rather than just treat its symptoms or slow it down, 
it's not uncommon for them to immediately express worries that we are playing God or interfering with Mother Nature. Maybe we are, but if so, that's not unique to people involved in the fight against aging. We fight diseases of all kinds that God or Mother Nature gave us. We've been doing for so long, and we've been keep, and we've been doing that for a long time to come. The world rightfully celebrated the eradication of smallpox in 1980, when malaria is likewise eradicated, and I believe it will be sometime in the coming decades. Our global community will rejoice once again. And if I could offer the world a, wo- a vaccine for HIV right now, there wouldn't be so many people, no decent ones at least, who would say that we should just la- let nature run its course. These are ailments we've long considered diseases, though, and I accept that it will take some time to convince people that aging is no different. To this end, I found that this thought experiment to be helpful. Imagine an Airbus A380, a double-decker super jumbo filled with 600 people on board on approach to Los Angeles. The plane doesn't have landing gear, only parachutes, and all but one of the doors is stuck. So when passengers evacuate one by one, they'll be scattered across the most densely populated area of the country. Oh, and one more thing, the passengers are sick, really sick. The disease they carry is highly contagious. It starts with lethargy and sore joints, then develops into hearing and vision loss, bones as brittle as century-old teacups, excruciatingly painful heart failure, and brain signals so badly interrupted that many victims won't even be able to remember who they are. No one survives this disease, and death is almost always agonizing. After a life of faithful service to the United States, you found yourself behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office of the White House. The phone rings. Deputy Director for Infectious Diseases from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention tells you that even if one of the passengers is permitted to parachute into the greater Los Angeles area, tens of thousands of people will catch the disease and die. Each additional parachuter will increase the projected death road toll exponentially. The moment you put your receiver down, the phone rings again. The chairperson of the Joint Chief of Staff tells you that six U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptor fighters are tracking the plane as it circles over the Pacific Ocean. The pilots have it locked in and missiles are ready. The plane is running out of gas and the fate of passengers and the entire United States rest upon your orders. What do you do? This is of course the trolley problem, an ethical thought experiment. The type popularized by philosopher Philippa Foot that pits our moral duty to not inflict harm on others against our society, social responsibility to save a greater number of lives. It's also, however, a handy metaphor because because the highly contagious disease the passengers are carrying is, as you doubtless have noticed, nothing more than a factor acting version of aging. When presented with the idea of a disease that could infect and kill legions of people with horrendous symptoms, no less, very few of us would make would not make the horrible but necessary call to shoot down the plane. With that in mind, consider this question. If you would sacrifice hundreds of people to stop a fast-acting version of aging, infecting millions, what would you be willing to do to prevent the disease as it actually occurs in the lives of everyone on the planet? Were you not, what I'm about to suggest won't actually come at the cost of human lives, not hundreds, not dozens, not even one, but it would require us to confront an idea that many people would find alarming, inflicting ourselves with a virus that would quickly move into every cell in our body, turning us into genetically modified organisms. The virus wouldn't kill, it would do the opposite. Get with the reprogram. 
vaccines against senescent cells, CR mimetics, and retrotransfusion suppressors are possible pathways to prolonged vitality. And work is, in a way, already in labs and clinics around the world. But what if we didn't need any of that? What if we could reset the aging clock and prevent cells from ever losing their identity and becoming senescent in the first place? Yes, the solution to aging would be cellular reprogramming, a resetting of the landscape, the way, for instance, that jellyfish have been shown to do by using small body fragments to regenerate polyps that spawn a dozen new jellies. The DNA blueprint to be young and after all is always present there, even when we are old. So, how can we make the cell reread the blueprint? Here it's helpful to return to the DVD metaphor. Over time, thanks to use and perhaps misuse the digital information encoded as bits in the top layer of aluminum, becomes obscured. by some deep and some fine scratches, making it hard for the DVD player to read the disc. A DVD has 30 miles of data spiraled around the disc from the edge to the center. So if the disc is scratched, finding the start of a particularly particular song becomes extremely difficult. It is the same situation for old cells, but far worse. The DNA in our cells holds about the same amount of data as a DVD. But in six feet of DNA that's packed into a cell, a tenth of a size of a speck of dust. Together, all the DNA in our body, if laid end to end, would stretch twice the diameter of the solar system. Unlike a simple DVD though, the DNA in our cells is wet and vibrating in three dimensions. And there aren't 50 songs, there are more than 20,000. No wonder gene reading becomes difficult the older we get. It's miraculous that any cell finds the right genes in the first place. There are two ways to play an old scratch DVD with fidelity. You could buy a better DVD player, one with more powerful laser that could reveal the data under the scratches. Or you could polish the disc to expose the information again, making the disc as good as new. I've heard a rag with two spaced on it works just fine. Restoring youth in an organism is never going to be as simple as polishing a disc with toothpaste. But the first approach, putting a scratch DVD into a new player, was. Oxford University professor John Gurdon first did this in 1958 when he removed chromosome from a frog's egg and replaced them with some chromosomes from an adult frog and obtained uh, living tadpoles. Then in 1996, Ian Wilmot and his colleagues at the University of Edinburgh replaced the chromosomes of a sheep's egg with those from an other cell. The result was Dolly, whose birth was met with a heated public debate about purported dangers of cloning. The debate overshadowed the most important point. The old DNA retains information needed to be young again. That debate has since died down. The world today has other concerns. Cloning is now routinely done to produce farm animals, race horses, and even pets. In 2017, you could order up a dog clone for bargain price of $40,000 or two of them. As Barbara Streisand did to replace her beloved Sammy, a curly-haired cotton chular the fact that Sammy was 14 when she died and donated cells that somewhere in the range of 75 in human years didn't impact the clones a bit. The implications of these experiments are profound. What they show is that aging can be reset, the scratches on the DVD can be removed and the original information can be recovered. Epigenomic noise is not a one-way street. But how might we reset the body without becoming a clone? In his 1948 publications about the preservation of information during data transmissions, Claude Shannon provided a valuable clue. 
In an abstract sense, he proposed that information loss is simply an incre- increase in entropy or the uncertainty of resolving a message and provided brilliant questions or equations to back his ideas up. His work stemmed from the mathematics of Harry Nyquist and Ralph Hartley, two other engineers at Bell Labs who, in the 1920s, revolutionized our understanding of information transmission. Their notions of an ideal code were important for Shannon's development of his communication theory. In the 1940s, Shannon became obsessed with communications over a noisy channel in which information is simply a set of possible messages that needs to be reconstructed by the recipient of the message, the receiver. As Shannon brilliantly showed in his noisy channel coding theorem, it's possible to communicate information nearly error-free as long as you don't exceed the channel capacity. But the data exceeds the channel capacity or is subject to noise, which is often the case with analog data. The best way to ensure it makes it to the receiver is to store a backup set of data. That way, even if uh, some primary data are lost, an observer can send this correcting data to the correcting device to recover the original message. This is how internet works. If data packets are lost, they're recovered and resend moments later, thanks to transmission control protocol and internet protocol. Um, as Shannon put it, this observer notes the errors in the recovered message and transmits data to the receiving point over the correction channel to enable receiver to correct the errors. Though it may sound esoteric language from the 1940s, what dawned on me in 2014 is that Shannon's mathematical theory of communication is relevant to the information theory of aging. In Shannon's drawing, there are three different components that have analogs in biology. The source of the information is the egg and the sperm from your parents. The transmitter is the epigenome, transmitting analog information through space and time. The receiver is your body in the future. When an egg is fertilized, epigenetic information, biological radio signals is sent out. It travels between dividing cells and across time. If all goes well, the egg develops into a healthy baby and eventually a healthy teenager. But with with successive cell divisions, the overreaction of the survival circuit to DNA damage, the cell becomes increasingly noisy. Eventually, the receiver, your body, when it's 80, has lost a lot of original information. We know that cloning a new dipole or a mammal from an old one is possible. So even if a lot of epigenetic information is lost in old age, Obscured by the epigenetic noise, there must be information that tells the cells how to reset. This fundamental information laid down early in life is able to tell the body how to be young again, the equivalent of a backup of the original data. To end aging as we know it, we need to find three more things that Shannon knew were essential for a signal to be restored, even if it's obscured by noise. An observer who records the original data, the original correction data, and a correcting device to restore the original signal. I believe we may have finally found the biological correcting device. In 2006, the Japanese stem cell researcher Shinya Yamanaka announced to the world that after testing dozens of combinations of genes, he had discovered a set of four OCT4, KLF4, SOX2, and CMYC could induce adult cells to become pluripotent stem cells or IBSCs, which are immature cells that can be coaxed into becoming any other cell type. These four gene codes were powerful transcription factors that could that each controls the entire sets of other genes that move cells around on the wide internal landscape during embryonic development. These genes are found in most 
multicellular species including chimpanzees, monkeys, dogs, cows, mice, rats, chickens, fish and frogs. For his discovery essentially showing that complete cellular age reversal was possible in a petri dish. Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine along with John Gordon in 2012. We now call these four genes Yamanaka factors. At first blush, Yamanaka's experiment might sound like a nifty laboratory parlor trick. But the implications for aging are profound, and not only because he paved the way for us to grow entirely new populations of blood cells, tissues, organs in the dish that can be and are being transplanted into patients. What he identifies, I believe, is the reset switch responsible for Gordon's stat bolts, the biological correcting device. I predict, and my students are now showing in the lab, that we can use these and other switches not just to reset ourselves in petri dishes, but to reset an entire body, the epigenetic landscape, to get the marbles back into the valleys where they belong, sending citrons back to where they came from, for instance. Cells that have lost their identity during aging can be led back to their true selves. This is the DVD polish that we've been looking for. We're making progress every week in restoring the youthful epigenome of mice by delivering reprogramming factors. The pace of discovery is mind-spinning. A full night of sleep for me and my lab members is increasingly rare. In the 1990s, there were major concerns about the safety of delivering genes to humans. But there are rapidly increasing number of approved gene therapy products and hundreds of clinical trials on the way. Patients with an RPE65 mutations that causes blindness, for example, can now be cured with a simple injection of a safe virus that infects the retina and delivers forever functional RPE65 gene. I predict that cellular reprogramming in the body will be first used to treat age-related diseases in the eye, such as glaucoma and macular degeneration. The eye is the organ of choice to trial gene therapies because it is immunologically isolated. But if the therapy is safe enough to deliver into the entire body, as long as, um, as the long-term mouse studies in my, mass, in my lab suggest they might be one day, this may be our future. At age 30, you could get a week's course of three injections that introduce a specially engineered adeno-associated virus or AAV, which causes a very mild immune response, even less than what is commonly caused by a flu shot. The virus, which has been known to scientists in the 1960s, has been modified so it doesn't spread or cause illness. What this theoretical version of the virus would carry would be a small number of genes, a combination of Yamanaka factors perhaps, and a fail-safe switch that could be turned off with a well-tolerated molecule, such as a doxycycline, an antibiotic that can be taken as a tablet or even better, one that's completely inert. Nothing at that point would change in the way your genes work. But when you begin to see and feel the effects of aging, likely sometime in your mid-40s, you would be prescribed a month's course of doxycycline. With that, reprogramming genes would be switched on. During the process, you likely place a drop-off blood in a home biotracker to pay or pay a visit to the doctor to make sure the system was working as expected but that's about it over the next month your body would undergo a regeneration rejuvenation process as Waddington's marbles were sent back to where they were once you were young um, gray hair would disappear Wounds would heal faster, wrinkles would fade, organs would regenerate, you would think faster, hear higher pitched sounds, and no longer need glasses to read a menu. Your body will feel young again. Like Benjamin Button, you would feel 35 again, then 30, then 25. But unlike Benjamin Button, that's where you would stop. The prescription would be discontinued. The AAV would also switch off. Yamanaga factors would fall silent. Biologically, physically, 
and mentally you would be a couple of decades younger but you would still retain all your knowledge wisdom and memories you would be young again not just looking young but actually young free to spend the next few decades of your life without the aches and pains of middle age untroubled by the prospects of cancer and heart disease then a few more decades down the road when those gray hairs begin showing up you would start another cycle of the prescribed trigger what's more with the pace at which biotech is advancing and as we learn how to manipulate factors that reset our cells we may be able to move away from using viruses and simply take a month's course of pills does that sound like science fiction something that's very far out in the future let me be clear it's not manuel serrano the leader of the cellular plasticity and disease laboratory at the institute for research in biomedicine in barcelona and juan carlos ipsipua at belmonte at the salk institute for bio bio biological studies in san diego have already engineered mice that have all of the yamanaka factors from birth these can be turned on by injecting the mice with doxycycline in a now famous study from 2016 when belmont triggered the yamanaka factors for just two days a week throughout the lifespan of a prematurely aging mouse breed called lmna The mice remained young compared to their untreated siblings and lived 40% longer. He's uh, shown that the skin and kidneys of regular old mice heal more quickly too. The Yamanaka treatment however was very highly toxic. If Belmont overdid it by giving the mice the antibiotic for a few more days the mice died. Serrano had shown that by pushing the marbles too far up the landscape the four gene combo could induce teratomas which are particularly disgusting tumors made up of several types of tissue such as hair muscle or bone clearly this tech is not ready for prime time at least not yet but we are getting closer every day to being able to control the warrington marbles safely making sure they land back precisely in their original valleys and not at the top of mountains when they would cause cancer While all this was going on guided by the success of ICE mouse experiments my lab had been looking for ways to delay and reverse epigenetic aging we tried many different approaches the NORC gene WNT the four yamanaka factors some had worked a little but most were turning into tumor cells one day in 2016 after feeling consistently for two years to get old cells to age in reverse without turning into tumor cells a brilliant graduate student named Wan Cheng Liu came into my office to say he was close to quitting as a final effort he suggested he try leaving the C my MYC gene that was likely the cause of teratomas and i encouraged him to do so He delivered a vital package, a viral package to mice, but this time with only 3 of the Yamanaka factors. Then turned them on using doxycycline and waited for all mice to get sick or die, but none of them did. They were totally fine. And after months of monitoring, no tumors arose either. It was a surprise to both of us, a great surprise. Instead of waiting another year to see if the mice lived longer, One chance suggested he use a mice mouse's optic nerve as a way to test age reversal and rejuvenation. I was skeptical. I'm not super optimistic this will work, I told him. Optic nerves just don't regenerate unless you are newborn. The intricate network of cells and fibers that transmit nervous signals across our bodies is divided into two parts. the peripheral system and the central system we have known for a long time that peripheral nerves like those in our arms and legs can grow back 
I'll be very very slowly the nerves of the central system though optic nerves and the nerves of the spinal cord never grow back even though scientists who bucked convention proposing novel therapies that could regenerate some aspect of the central system have generally been circumspect about the potential for significant gro- regrowth decades a work aimed at reversing glaucoma in the eye and spinal cord injuries has had almost no positive momentum you picked the hardest problem in biology to solve i told wanjan but he replied if we could solve that problem there might have been a thousand ways to measure the impact of age reversal in mice but buoyed by his recent successes he decided to go big or go home i like that no one changes the world by not taking risks i told them go test it the images that came to me in a text message a few months later took my breath away so much so that i needed to make sure what i was seeing was real i called wanchen immediately am i seeing what i think i'm seeing maybe he said what are you seeing the future i said wanchen let out a tremendous sigh of relief david he said an hour ago i thought i was going to fail for researchers doubt is no vice doubt is a very normal and human consequence of pushing yourself to do audacious things without knowing how those things are going to work out but on that day things sure did seem to be working out at the image one shen first texted me looked like an orange glowing jellyfish its head was at the top with the eye of the mouse sits with long tentacles flowing downwards towards the brain two weeks earlier yuan cheng and our collaborators had squeezed the optic nerve a few millimeters from the back of the eye with a set of tweezers causing almost all the nerve cells axons and tentacles to die back towards the brain they injected an orange fluorescent dye into the eye that is taken up by living neurons so when yuan cheng took a microscope and looked below the crushed side there were no glowing nerves just a mass of dead cell remnants the next page picture he sent was an example of one where the reprogramming virus had been turned on after the crush instead of dead cells a network of long healthy spindly tentacles was making its way to connect up with the brain it was the greatest example of nerve regeneration in history and wan cheng was only just getting started No one had really expected the reprogramming to work so well. One month, old mice were initially chosen for these experiments to give us the greatest chance of success because that's what everyone else does. But Wan Cheng and our skilled collaborators in Professor Ji Zhang's his lab at Children's Hospital at Harvard Medical School have now tested our reprogramming r- regimen on the damaged optic nerves of middle-aged mice 12 months. their nerves also regenerate as i write this we have restored vision in regular old mice vision declines dramatically in a mouse by 12 months of age bruce snander and meredith gregory snander from massachusetts i and ear at harvard no no this well this is a loss of the nerve impulses in the retina and old mice don't move their heads often when moving lines are displayed in front of them because they simply don't see them david i must have, i must admit bruce said i never expected this reprogramming stuff to work on normal agent eyes i was only testing your virus because you were so excited to try it the result he had seen the morning before had been the most exciting thing in his research life our osk reprogramming virus had restored vision a few weeks later Made it showed that reprogramming also works to reverse vision loss caused by internal eye pressure known as glaucoma. Do you know what we've discovered? Bruce re- remarked. Everyone has been working to slow the progression of glaucoma. This treatment restores vision if adult cells in the body even old nerves can be reprogrammed to regain a youthful ex- epigenome and the information to the young cannot all be lost there must be a repository of correction data a backup set of data or molecular beacons 
that is retained through adulthood and can be accessed by Yamanaka factors to reset the epigenome using cellular equivalent of TCP-IP. But those youth markers are, we're still not unsure. We're still not sure. They are likely to involve methyl tags and DNA, which are used to estimate an organism's age, the so-called Horvath clock. They likely also involve something else, a protein, an RNA, or even a novel chemical attached to DNA uh, that we haven't discovered yet. But whatever they're made of, they are important, for they would be the fundamental correcting data that cells attain over a lifetime that somehow direct a reboot. We also need to find the observer, the one who records what the original signal is when we are young. It can't just be the DNA methylation because that doesn't explain how the reprogrammed cells know how to focus on something a youthful methyl marks and strip off the old ones that accumulated during aging. The cell equivalent of the scratches on the DVD. Perhaps it's a specialized histone or a transcription factor or a protein that latches onto methylated DNA when you are developing in utero and stays there for 80 years waiting until a signal comes from the correct device to restore the original information. In Claude Shannon's preglance, uh, when the correcting device is switched on by infecting cells with OSK genes, the cell somehow knows how to contact the observer and use the correction data to restore the original signal to that of a young cell. Growing new nerves and restoring eyesight wasn't enough for Yuan Chen. When the DNA of the damaged neurons was examined, they seemed to be going through a very rapid aging program, one that was countered by the reprogramming factors. The neurons that received the reprogramming factors didn't age and they didn't die. This is a radical idea, but one that makes a lot of sense. Severe cellular injuries overwhelms the cir survival circuit and accelerates aging of the cells, leading to death unless the clock is somehow reversed. With these discoveries, we may be on the verge of understanding what makes biological time tick and how to wind it back. We know from our experiments that biological information correcting device requires enzymes called 1011 translocation enzymes or TETs which clip off methyl tags from DNA, the same chemical tags that mark the passage of the Horvath aging clock. This is no coincidence and points to the DNA methyl methylation clock as not just an indicator of age but a controller of it. It's a difference between wristwatch and a physical time. In their role as a component of the correcting device, TTs um, cannot just strip off all methyls from genome, for that would turn a cell into primordial stem cell. We would not have old mice that can see better, we would have blind mice with tumors. How the TTs know to remove only the more recent methyls while preserving the original ones is a complete mystery. It will likely take an another decade and many other labs works to know precisely what the biological equivalent of the TCP IP information recovery system is. But whatever it is, eyesight that should not be able to be restored is being restored and cells that should not be able to regrow are regrowing. Compared to the decades of research into how slowing down aging and age-related disease, um, by a few percent, the reprogramming work has been relatively quick and easy. All it took was an intrepid idea and a courage to buck convention. The future looks interesting, to say the least. If we can fix the toughest to fix and regenerate the toughest to regenerate cells in our body, there's no really a reason to suspect we cannot grow or regrow any type of cells in our bodies that our bodies need. Yes, that could mean fixing fresh spinal cord injuries, but it could also mean regrowing any kind of tissue in our body that has been damaged by age. From the liver to the kidney, from the heart to the brain, nothing is off the table. So far, the three Yamanaka gene combination seems safe in mice 
even when turned on for a year. But there's still plenty of work to be done. There's still a lot of unanswered questions. Can we deliver the combination to all cells? Will it eventually cause cancer? Should we keep the genes on or turn them off to let the cells rest? Will this work in some tissues better than the others? Can it be given to middle-aged people before they become sick? The same way we take statins to keep cholesterol in check to prevent heart disease. I have little doubt that cellular reprogramming is the next frontier in aging research. One day, it might be possible to reprogram cells via pills that stimulate activity of the OSKs, factors, or the TTs. This may be simpler than it sounds. Natural molecules stimulate TT enzymes, including vitamin C and alpha ketoglutate, uh, a molecule made in mitochondria that is boosted by CR and when given to nematode worms, extends their lifespans too. For now, uh, though the best bet is gene therapy. Because it could be so impactful, we should start debating the ethics of this technology now before it arrives on our doorstep. The first question is who should be allowed to use this technology? A select few? The rich, the very sick, should doctors let people who have terminal illnesses try it for so-called compassionate use? How about people over 100 or 80 or 60? When does the reward outweigh the risk? There's an army of people willing to boldly go. Sound-minded volunteers in their 90s and 100s whose bodies have been broken down by the disease of aging. I can assure you that there's no shortage of those who've peered up the road and perhaps a few more years of life that is defined by ever-increasing frailty and pain and are ready to take a chance at a few more good years. If not for that, then for the chance to give their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren a longer, healthier life. Or do they have to lose after all? The ethics of the technology becomes more difficult, though if reprogramming becomes safe enough to use it in a way that's preventative. At what age should it be given? Does a disease have to appear before an antibiotic activator of reprogramming is prescribed? If mainstream doctors refuse to help, will people head overseas? If technology could significantly cut healthcare costs, should it be mandated? And if we can help children live longer, healthier lives, do we have a moral obligation to do so? If reprogramming technology can help a child repair an eye or recover from a spinal injury, should the genes be delivered before an accident happens? So they are ready to be switched on at a moment's notice, starting perhaps with an antibiotic drip in the ambulance. If smallpox were to return to our planet, after all, parents who refuse to vaccinate their children would perhaps would be prize of the lowest order. When safe and effective treatments are available for common childhood disease, Parents who refuse to save their children's lives can have their guardianship overridden by the doctrine of parents' priority. Should every human have a choice to suffer from aging, or should that choice be made? As vaccine decisions are in most cases for the good of both the individuals and humankind. Will those who elect to be rejuvenated still have to pay for those who decided not to? Is it morally wrong not to do so? Knowing you will prematurely become a burden on family members. These are theoretical questions today, but they probably won't remain theoretical for long. In late 2018, a Chinese researcher, He Jian Kui, reported that he had helped create the world's first genetically altered children girls whose births sparked a debate in scientific circles about the ethics of using gene editing to make designer babies. The side effects of inducing DNA damage in embryos and the accuracy of gene editing are not well understood yet, which is why the scientific community has had such a violent negative reaction. There is also a tacit reason. Scientists are fearful that gene editing technologies, if abused, will go the way of GMOs 
and be outlawed for political or irrational reasons for their true potential can be realized. These fears may be unfounded if news of the first genetically modified children had broken in the 2000s. It would have, it would have sparked global debate and dominated the news for months. Protesters would have stormed the labs and presidents would have been banned this use of technology on embryos. But how times have changed with the new with the new cycle of hours and politics dished out over the internet. The story lasted a few days then the world moved on to another more interesting topic. He stated the intention was to give the twins the ability to resist HIV. This may sound admirable, but if I do the numbers, the risk wasn't worth it. The chance of contracting HIV in China is less than 1 in 1000. If he was going to maximize health effects to offset the risks of the procedure, why not edit a gene that causes heart disease, which has an almost 1 in 2 chance of killing them? or aging which has 90% chance of killing them HIV immunity was just the simplest edit not the most impactful as these technologies become commonplace and parents ponder how to get the biggest bang for the buck how long will it be before another rogue scientist teams up with the world's most driven helicopter parent to create a genetically modified family with the capacity to resist the effects of aging it may not be long at all <laughs>